Molly McClure. And this is Faith on Film, a program designed to keep you aware and informed on everything that's happening in the world of faith and family entertainment. In today's program, probably more of faith entertainment. Holly, we totally ran out of time last week. And let's get into the second one so we don't run out of again. We have so much to talk about. It's exciting. Well, let's do it then. Guys, Dave uh, and Rich Cristiano, welcome back to the show. Good to be back. Yeah. Thank you. You know, now give a little introduction so people know who they are in case they didn't catch the first show. You guys were going to kick us out. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and I'll make yeah, I'll make it brief uh, here so that well, again we don't run out of time. But uh, Dave and Rich Cristiano of, of are to me pioneers in the faith uh, mm-hmm. film industry. They've been making Christian films for I don't even know how many years. I've known them for probably about twenty. Uh, they make very strong uh, movies with a strong Christian message. Uh, And I'm very excited to have them on here because their movies have touched my heart. Uh, Several of their movies have really blessed me, touched my heart, and and, uh, just brought in just a new refreshing. It's sort of like going in and doing a great worship service. It just, you know, pumps you up. Uh, So Dave, now, I think Dave is the oldest of the two, right? Right, five minutes older. Five minutes older. Hey, that's that's enough to get you to be the first one uh, to start talking. Now, we, we were talking a lot about Christian films versus, versus, I don't even know what I want, just good family you know films and everything. And I was kind of giving you guys a little pushback a little bit, not because I don't believe in what you're doing or because I don't agree with you or anything like that, but just because I wanted to really get the whole conversation started here. And uh, we kind of got cut off because we ran out of time. So do you remember a little bit of what we talked about? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I would like to give you an example. So those of you watching part two here, go watch part one if you haven't seen it. <laughs> we were talking about a movie called The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry that we produced. Um, the movie's about a 75-year-old man living in the year 1970. He starts having Bible studies with these three 12-year-old boys to motivate them to read the Bible and follow the Lord. Now, Gavin McLeod plays Jonathan Sperry. Everyone remembers him as the captain of the love boat. He was on Mary Tyler Moore. So we flew to Chicago to show the movie to about 100 p- people that were potentially interested in sponsoring the movie for their local theater. And it was set up by the local Christian TV station there. And so I did an intro to the film. And what we would do is show the film. Gavin would get up and speak. And then I would get up and we'd have a Q&A. And, and I would talk about sponsorships. But as part of my intro, I asked everybody a question. Do you have a gang problem here in Chicago? And every hand went up. I said, OK, after this movie, ask me why I think The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry is the perfect movie to show gang members. So we show the movie. Now, if you've seen this film, this is what I call Andy Griffith for the Lord. This is a squeaky clean movie. There is a bully in our movie, but he's a pretty harmless bully. So afterwards, you know, Gavin got up and he was always very emotional after this movie because mm-hmm. it, it was the most, he said, it's the most important thing I've ever done. And he's always crying and stuff. And Gavin was terrific. So then I got up there and somebody raises their hand and says, OK, how is this the perfect movie to show gang members? And I said, it's perfect. And they said, but how? I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Make a movie that shows rapes and killings and drugs and incest and all this stuff and sin these guys see every day? Is that how we're going to reach them? I said, look, they're going to watch this movie. They're all going to identify with Nick the Bully. And I want to show them there's a lifestyle 180 degrees from what you guys are used to, because that's what it's going to take for you to come to the Lord. The Lord says, look, you got to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Search for me with all your heart. you got to put me first, Luke 14. This is what it's going to take. And I'm going to trust God to use it. Sometimes we underestimate God here. And they kind of, I thought it was an interesting apply. Yeah, I want a gang member to watch this movie. I think he'll identify. It's something totally different. And this is where the rub comes. Lots of times we think we got to be like the world to reach the world. This is kind of what we were getting in the last time. And I'll give you another example. Let's look at Abraham and Lot. Lot tried to reach the world. He, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Well, how many did you reach, Lot? How many did you reach over there? In fact, you lost your wife as a count of it. And so this is where the argument comes, you know. And yes, I think we need to strategize in how we do our films. This is what we've learned. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, it's not, are you preaching or are you trying to reach? And I, as I said in the first episode, um, I think you've got to establish characters of authority. Like in the Time Changer movie, Gavin McLeod's character becomes a character of authority. So I think when he speaks, people want to hear what he has to say because we establish it that way. 
And I think that the non-believer, um, they'll listen. Now, can we make them come to the Lord? No. But if you do the crossover movies where there's virtually nothing in it, um, I think it's harder, much harder. And I'm not so sure God's pleased with that and is using all that. You know, like one person made a comment to me once, the book of Esther, their comeback was this. Well, the book of Esther doesn't mention God or Jesus. I said, true. Then I answered him, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> so people know the context of it, you know. And being raised a Roman Catholic, as I was, and watched films like The Ten Commandments, and the religious movies that came out, and even though I liked them and they made me feel somewhat inspired, I was no closer to the truth, no closer. And if I would have died before the age of 83, I'd be spending eternity in hell. I mean, we're talking about eternity here. And so I'd rather be clear about it. I will say one other thing about this, then someone else can chime in. Just think of this, Isaac, if you had a chance this Sunday to preach to a quarter of a million people, but it's a one-shot deal, okay? You got an hour, you got 90 minutes, one-shot deal. You gonna talk to him about the Lord in some case? Sure you are. You know what, when you make a movie, a 90-minute movie, for most people, it's a one-shot deal. They watch your movie one time. So how much of the Lord do you wanna talk? How much message do you wanna give them, you know? And since most guys anyways in the Christian movies make the crossover movies, I'll let them make their films. We'll stick to our guns. I will say this, it's, we'll just stick to our guns and we'll make the films that are a little bit more for the church. And that's fine, I'm, I'm fine with that. I feel like this is what the Lord wants me to do and my brother, and it's always been our strategy. So we'll stick with it, you know, and everybody's gotta do what they feel like the Lord's telling them to do. But lots of times, you know, we say the Lord's telling us to do it, and it's really our own self doing it. And that's a whole nother argument. But, I think you get the point. Dave? Okay, I would like, let me throw this at you real quick. Rich and I were speaking at the International Christian Film Festival in Orlando. It's a large Christian film festival. And here was the question posed to me. Why do you do Christ-centered films? Because that's what I call them. Why do you guys do films with direct messages for Christ and the gospel? Why do you do Christian films? And here was my answer. The most important thing in my life is my salvation. There's nothing more important to me than my salvation. The second most important thing to me is your salvation. That's why I do Christian films. That's my mindset. So when I look at Christian films, there's the films that have no gospel. Then there's the films with prosperity gospel. They're both off to me. And to me, the pro and I, the pro it's another show. The prosperity gospel is the most dangerous thing going. I always tell people this. Read the book of 2 Corinthians, probably one of the most least read books in the New Testament. That, to me, is the true Christian life. You know, Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up a cross daily, follow me. That says a lot. So Rich and I have just tried to stay with Jesus, the gospel, Straight and narrow here with our messages. We are trying to reach people for Christ, and so you've got to present Christ. That's my thing there. In the previous show, we talked about the power of Hollywood and the media. I did a movie called Power of the Air to try to show people how powerful Hollywood is. <clears throat> to me, it's the most powerful force on the planet. Satan has greatly used it. I mean, a person will watch a movie way before they'll listen to a sermon. Mm -hmm. People, and you can really use movies to reach people, and that's what we've tried to do. It is exciting. It's exciting to put a message for Christ in your movie, to see somebody react to it in a positive way. You feel like you're really doing something. Our life has purpose and meaning, and we are excited about what we're doing. I, I'm with Rich in the previous show we talked about. The streaming services, even though they don't pay very much, pennies on the view, more people are seeing our films now than ever, and that's exciting. The films are getting out there. The messages are getting out there. Some people like what you do, some don't. That's just the way it is. And we go back well, I, now to faithfulness and purpose. You have been faithful to your purpose, and I think God <laughs> is, God is uh, blessing you by, by uh, honoring that purpose and having that many people watch your films. Now, has it made you all rich? No, I get it. But that's not what's important to you. And actually, God's God, God's taking care of it. God, God's never going to let you down, is he? 
No, no, look, we're, we're doing fine. In other words, I'm, I got no debt here. You know, I mean, think about it. We're a little studio now. It's funny, when I originally wanted to go to Hollywood, I'll back up when I was 15, 16 years old. We grew up in Waterloo, New York, and there was one theater three miles away called The Strand, where they showed one movie at a time. So my brother and I would go and watch the movies, and we would sit in about the 20th row, and we called it 20th Row Sense. We'd watch the movie and say, that's a loser. Universal should have called us and talked to us about this because we could have told them, that's a loser. And it seemed like the films we liked were doing real well, and the films we didn't like weren't doing well at the box office. So I thought, you know, maybe I ought to go to Hollywood and see if I can run a studio. Because I just feel, feel like I can pick the films, you know? And it's funny how that's all kind of come full circle. I tell people we're like Universal Studios now and Paramount. We're just this big, okay? But you know what? Thankfully, I can produce any film I want to produce and I can distribute any film I want to distribute. I can say what I want to say. And there's some power in that. There, there's some um, freedom in that is better, you know? And what we're trying to learn is to build distribution. What I'm learning is promotion. We've never spent money promoting our movies. Just now, lately, we started to promote. I, I mentioned earlier, our, my website, thechristianmovies.com, people say, oh, nobody buys DVDs anymore. Well, I disagree, you know. We're selling them every day. Um, and, you know, certainly streaming is coming up, and we're doing all of it, you know. So, as my brother said, it is getting exciting. And think about it, you know, to make a movie that the Lord uses to touch somebody's life or change somebody's life, and only God can do it, okay? All we can do is water and plant. I say this all the time. I've been a Christian since May 3rd, 1980. You wanna know how many people I've led to the Lord? None, zero. I guess what, Isaac, Holly, neither of you, neither did Billy Graham. All you can do is water and plant. Right. The issue is, are you watering and planting the truth? You know, the first, no, the first non-Catholic church service ever walked into in my life was John MacArthur at Grace Community Church in Panorama right. City. I mean, he's one of the finest Bible teachers ever, right? See, God yeah. made the type guy that I needed to hear. And probably in the 1980s, my brother and I listened to maybe a thousand MacArthur sermons on tape. And that's how we kind of grew in the Lord and how we were kind of discipled and you know, also when we started in the Christian film industry back in 1985, it was just a rental business. You had ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, and 16 millimeter Christian films. That was your media. And the Christian film libraries, as they called them all around the country, were very evangelical people. And their buyers were the pastors and the youth pastors. They were the renters. And so if your movie didn't have a message, they didn't even pick it up. I mean, there's some guys that tried to make some films and they wouldn't even pick them up. <laughs> so that's how we came into it. Um, and we wanted to make those types of films and we got trained that way and we just stuck with it. You know, as I said, our, our strategy established. And I'll give you this, you know, we brought up the thing about faithfulness and motives. That actually happened to me in 1988. I was at a revival service at Central Baptist Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas, the church I was attending, which is a solid Southern Baptist church. And the, the revival guy was on a Sunday night. The preacher said, look, there's only two things God's looking for in your life. If you never hear anything I say the rest of this week, in fact, if you never hear anything a preacher says to you the rest of your night, life, get these two things. He's looking for faithfulness and motives and don't ever forget it. And that hit me as a brick. Okay, God, you want me to make faithful films for you with pure motives. The other thing at the time that I was doing, I read a book by Charles Spurgeon called Around the Wicked Gate. Wicked, W-I-C-K-E-T. And, and for Spurgeon, the wicked gate was the narrow gate of Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. And here's what Spurgeon said, and I'll bring it up to modern times. Outside the wicked gate are professing Christians, Sunday school goers, religious people, people that think they're Christians, but they're really not. And what the church wants to do is they want to take all their evangelistic efforts and they want to go try to reach the guy at the L.A. Times who could care less about any of this, water down the message, let's go reach him. And Spurgeon says, don't do that. In fact, Jesus Christ told you, don't do that. Don't cast your pearl to the swine in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Spurgeon says, let's reach the people around the wicked gate or the narrow gate. And so I applied that to filmmaking. Okay, Lord. We're going to try to reach people 
the mission field starts in the church. That's where we're going to start. We're going to go there and we're going to trust you. <laughs> Look, I did a, a short film called Second Glance, 50 minute movie. And when it came out on VHS in 1995, I got a call from this girl in Washington, D.C. She was one of the actresses in the movie and she moved to Washington, D.C. And she goes, I want to get a VHS. I said, yeah, I'll send you one. She goes, do you mind sending me two? I said, sure, what's the second one for? She goes, I'm going to try to get it to President Clinton. This girl was from Arkansas, and the Clintons are very friendly toward people from Arkansas. And from time to time, she gets to go to the White House. So I sent her two copies. Now, whether she ever gave President Clinton a copy of Second Glance, I don't know. But it illustrates the point of how God can use yeah. people to reach people. Holly might know somebody that works at the right. L.A. Times who's a good friend of her. I'm going to make a film for Holly. Holly can give it to that person. That's another strategy that I think that our films can be used. So hopefully that's a good example. Also, I want to say in, in today's times right now in our culture, I'm hearing a lot of people that I know say, just because you say you're Christian doesn't mean you are. There's a lot. In fact, I have a girlfriend who just posted, yay, you know, pro-life sanctimony after the Supreme Court thing on her a social media page and another friend who is a Christian responded back that offends me that you would say that and not be understanding for these women who need an abortion blah 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 and not to get off of that topic but I'm just saying just because people say they're Christians these days there's a lot of different definitions of people who are and I think we are coming to a time where we've lived through the 80s and 90s and seen the lackadaisical the entertaining Christendom you know I think you guys are more on point um, the scripture that says many will cry Lord Lord and I'll say I never knew you and the agape of know you I would love to have a movie explaining that I never knew you because I think people think just because they say they are, that's going to be their ticket to heaven. But you can still be for abortion. You can still be for other things because, you know what I mean? I mean, I know I'm broad brushing. I'm just saying, though, we are in such a cultural and spiritual warfare right now with what's right, wrong, right, truth is truth. You know, things are reversed and switched. I think more than ever, stories that really sit at home and are truthful, like you guys saying, get the word strong and just be what it is and be the word. That's what people need. Yeah, we want to shine, we want to shine the light bright. We don't want to have it dim. You know, look, we got to do what's in us to do, and we do. Rich and I, we're going to put a message for Christ in our films. I just shot a movie called Always a Winner. I just finished production. I did a movie called Remember the Goal, came out in 2016 about girls cross country team. Took the coach character, did a second film in 2019 called The Perfect Race. The third film is coaching a girls golf team. I did these films and I had messages that I wanted to deal with. This is the most evangelistic and maybe the most practical of the three. The first two have done really well for me. I'm excited about this one. I just started editing the film. So it's exciting to do a movie that has a message. This has a strong message. To me, the strongest of the three. So I'll be excited when it gets out there. Am I worried about it? No. Do I think, oh, I hope people like it? No, I don't think that way. I mm -hmm. just do what's in me to do. I do the best I can. I'm always trying to do the best quality work I can. Rich and I do a lot of this ourselves. You learn, you learn. I learn more with every film I've ever done. I learn more on this film than any film I've done, but I say that after every film. But you just learn, it's a craft you're always learning. So I pray that God anoints our films, and I, I know I need God touched on these films, that he would use them. I pray that God would use the films to reach people for Christ, because ultimately that's what's most important. Right. Everybody's going to die one day, and you're going to enter into eternity. That's what drives me. I know it drives my brother as well. We talk about it a lot. We talk about message. How can we put a strong, good craft and craft the message we're trying to do the best we can. I'm not trying to shove down things down people's throats. We're trying to effectively communicate the message, the gospel message. Yeah, Isaac and Holly, for example, here, I just shot a movie called Mind Reader. Now, if, if we're ever gonna get accused of shooting a crossover movie, this is gonna be it, okay? <laughs> but it's about a guy who's the closing act in a variety show in 1974. He comes out on stage, throws a ball out at random, three people catch it. He gives him a pad and a marker, write down a number from one to 100, he guesses it, write down a word, he talks to him individually, he guesses their word. 
The Local Magicians Association, which is the national organization, cannot figure out how this is done. This guy's getting more popular and more popular, and eventually they're going to shut him down out of jealousy. Now, this concept is a concept we've had for almost 20 years, and the whole purpose of this movie's evangelism, the whole purpose of this movie is to share the gospel. And I think, though, the very first scene, whether you're a believer or non-believer or atheist, I think after the first scene, you're pulled into this movie. How is this guy doing it? And I'm hoping the Lord can use this film to touch hearts. Look, think about this. If the four, five of us were going to make a martial arts film, okay, how many fights and kicks should we put in there? One or eight? Well, if you're going after the hardcore martial arts people, you better put eight because they're going to be disappointed if you only put one. Yep. That's when we make our films. We try to put eight fights in them, you know. But I think the Mind Reader movie can be used I did a film about UFOs, um, very evangelistic movie. And I think anybody interested in that subject can be pulled in. So I think I tell the Christian filmmakers, I think anything can work if it's well thought out. The Holly McClure story can work <laughs> if we think it out. In other words, you know, in other words, anything can work. Right. If you take the time to work the scripts. You know, we try to write tight scripts if there's any filmmakers watching. I mean, most of our films were cutting 30 seconds out. Think about that. Oh, cut, wow. out, <laughs> cut out 39 minutes. I mean, he shot another feature, you know, half a feature. So we take the time to work the scripts back and forth, back and forth. I mean, stuff doesn't write itself. It just doesn't happen. And all she can do is play in your own area, your arena. I have a little slogan, stay in your lane. And I know that some of the stuff we say just comes off wrong because people disagree with the strategy, and that's fine. You know, I'm not going to change the way those guys think, and we're just going to stick to our guns. But I think if you look at our titles, we've done a variety of subjects. I know my brother mentioned his new movie, Always a Winner, and one of his sub-messages in there is a very good message for pro-life that I think is the way to approach it. And, uh, you know, that's a hot subject right now, obviously, yeah. you know, this is dated and people watching this three years from now, but um, the pro-life thing is huge in the news right now. And I think that message will be used um, when people watch that film, you know. It will uh, always be in the news. It will always be, it, for 50 years, it's been a topic that's been a debate and it still will be. So that's great because there needs to be more on that. Uh, I can, I'm passionate about we need more films showing that and showing, you know, I just had, we had, my daughter is pastors of a co-pastor in the church. In their church, uh, this couple just had two twin girls at 23 weeks. One of them died, but the other one is surviving now. She's been alive a month and thriving, but she was born at 23 weeks. You abort a baby at 23 weeks. She's holding that baby in her arms. There's a picture of it. There's nothing more powerful than seeing on screen for people thinking about it and going, wow, I would be doing that. So yes, movies like that. That's how movies impact, Holly, like you said. Yeah, Holly, I just, I just hit this message and always the winner. And I felt like my actresses did a wonderful job with those particular scenes. They, they really were spot on and how we did it and how we handle it. So I'm excited about it coming out. It's a strong message. Good. It needs to be a strong message. You can't, you can't tiptoe around this one. It's, yeah. it's Let, an easy no brain. Yeah. 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 Let's circle back to something for a second that Isaac kind of brought up, look, and my brother really brought it up. Look, the media is powerful. Movies are powerful, right? I'll give you a quick illustration. In 1991, the first movie I ever did is a movie called The Appointment. This is the first film I ever directed. And um, I was showing it at a retreat to about 100 people. It's a true story. But their pastor wasn't there, and I knew that. And so I told the guy running the retreat, I'm going to do a little intro to this film. He goes, okay. So I'm talking a little about the film. And I had to stand up. I said, do you go to church? He goes, yes, I do. I said, do you go every week? And he goes, yes, I do. I said, okay. What did your pastor talk about from the pulpit one month ago? Now, the guy looked at me like I asked him a chemistry question, you know. He didn't know. He looked at his wife. She didn't know. He looked at me because I don't know. I said, you don't know. I'm going to tell your pastor on you. Everybody started to laugh. He started to sit down. I said, wait a minute, sir. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever seen a movie called The Wizard of Oz? He goes, yes, I have. I said, when's the last time you've seen that movie? He thought, oh, I don't know. It's been forever, 10 or 15 years ago. I said, good. Tell me about it. 
And I gave you the longest stare dust that sir, I gave you this microphone and a half hour to tell me about Dorothy Toto, Scarecrow, Tin Man, Lion, Wicked Witch, Munchkins, the whole deal. He goes, I could. Now, Isaac and Holly, this is a movie he said he hadn't seen for 10 or 15 years, but he could tell me detail after detail after detail, but couldn't remember what his pastor talked about from the pulpit one month wow. ago. Wow. The movies are powerful, and if you don't yeah. think they affect us, they do. You know, one of the most convicting movies ever in my life was a movie called Back to the Future. Now, everybody's seen that film, and from a secular viewpoint, that's one of the best movies ever made. If you look at the elements of film, it's a great story, great script, action. You got visual effects, you got all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's hard to criticize that movie. But I did notice this five or six times the lead character, Marty McFly, just says Jesus Christ out of nowhere. This blasphemes the name of the Lord. And that's where I get convicted, you know. In other words, we say we love Jesus. We say we follow Jesus. But when they slander his name, he sit in there all in the name of entertainment. Just think if he said, Rich Christiano, mom's a jerk five or six times. Would I have sat in there? No, I would have sued Amblin Entertainment, Spielberg's company, and Universal for slander to try to get money from him. This is where the rubber hits the road. And so, like, you know, do you love the name of the Lord? Yeah. Do you love the name of the Lord enough to turn away from movies that blaspheme his holy name? Right, right. You make, you make that stand, and you're right. going to limit almost every film coming out of Hollywood because the quickest way to get a PG rating is blaspheme the name of the Lord, and you're going to get a PG. So this shows you how powerful movies are, and it's causing us to do things that we don't want to do. I think, personally, people watch way too much stuff, and I know we're on the YouTube channel here. We want people to watch all the stuff we have on here. Um, but you got to apply Philippians for greater if you want to know whatever is right, holy, pure. Uh, think on these things. I'll apply that to the movies you watch, too, and maybe your life will be different. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're out of time again. I, I can't believe how fast these things go. Guys, thanks so much for taking time Thank to come you. on for two shows with us. Uh, I, I think these shows are going to get a lot of response, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come with us. Holly, any last words? Well, when you guys get done with these movies, send it my way. Let's review. Let let Isaac and I at least feature them and talk about them and do a little review on it and a blurb on it so we can promote it for you as well because I, I want to do that for you. I'm passionate about your stories and your movies. Thank you for coming with us and sharing what you've done. Yeah, Amen. Yes. Uh, <laughs> folks, don't forget Thank you can you write us. You can write us at faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. That's faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. And always follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at faithonfilmtv. Until next week, take and care. I, yes. and and Isaac, what's their website so they can go get films? Oh, the that's right. what, what's, what's your website, guys? Uh, ChristianMovies.com and Dave's is ChristianFilms.com. Okay, ChristianMovies.com and Christian ChristianFilms.com. Films. Christian. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you both for letting us come on and, oh, and share our stuff, and hopefully it was, it'll be used. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Folks, see you next week.